Hilary Aburi, Mark Leeser, Martin Husserlet. Thank you very much indeed for agreeing to present uh, your views and to discuss your views on the recently adopted Digital Services Act. We know that this, uh, this legislative proposal was uh, introduced jointly with the Digital Markets Act. And we also know that our life is so compartmentalized, so divided and busy that even in the nearest areas, uh, we struggle to understand the, the nitty gritty of the neighboring proposals often or many of us because so much is going on within our own narrow cluster. So I wanted to use this opportunity uh, for the DMA cohort to learn more about the DSA, the possible in interaction uh, discrepancies and similarities, mutual impact, etc. But also maybe for the DSA cohort, we, if we can use this label, to learn from, from three prominent uh, thinkers and uh, you know, commentators um, about the latest development, maybe your nuanced observations, what is going in the right way, what is going in not the right way, etc. So we will have kind of spontaneous conversation on on the DSA as such, but also in the kind of from the perspective of, of the development of competition in digital markets as well. So let me start, uh, Martin, with asking you perhaps to kind of to provide us kind of a general uh, explication of the motivation of the DSA and how well it was adopted, the ideas, how how accurately they have been implemented into the final in the final version of, of, of the regulation. Thank you very much, uh, Olive, and thanks a lot for having me. It's great to exchange some views, uh, even though after a long day, um, but something intellectually stimulating to, to end the day is always good. Um, yeah, so Digital Services Act, the way I, uh, I try to describe it when I uh, also teach it to my students is to say it's a second generation of rules for um, digital services. And uh, while the first generation of rules in um, 2000 and the late 90s was mostly about regulating, particularly in the EU, regulating the member states um, in terms of what they can do when imposing liability and thereby incentivizing potentially that there will be um, a development of this internet economy. Um, the second generation of rules is actually regulating companies. So it's turning uh, you know, big user generated content uh, services um, from search to video sharing to uh, uh, to other services into regulated businesses, particularly if they're big. And I think the DSA, at least for me, the two main components, right? Um, so one component is uh, or zero component is the component of basically incorporating the old rules and building upon the old rules. Uh, so the baseline when it comes to liability remains. Um, perhaps is a little bit uh, even uh, broadened, but um, the second generation of rules, I think for me, comes in two, um, in two categories. So first is um, a DSA, I think, responds to the demand um, that we regulate the disputes um, in the digital environment about the content um, in a way that give uh, much more due process rights to individuals who are impacted by this. So actually the first limb of the SA for me, the prescriptive one that applies to a bigger part of the ecosystem um, is about due process um, in content moderation. So what we call content moderation uh, is from individuals' perspective, you know, um, the decision making about the individual content. You know, it's about someone's life, uh, uh, life's work. It's about someone's um, important source of income. So the, the, these are not just, you know, uh, small things. So first thing for me, um, it's the is the due process. Um, where we create very horizontal rules and uh, ways how to resolve the disputes in a way that uh, proceduralize much of decision-making, it doesn't necessarily take away all the power of platforms. This is one of the things is that DSA does not constrain all that much. The rule-making power, as I call it, so ability to um, not accept content that is legal um, on the platform. So there are limits, there are very limited limits on, on what platforms um, uh, can do here. Platforms can continue to do a lot. But in terms of decision making, once they pick their rules, in addition to what parliaments already came up with when they uh, legislated uh, something to be illegal, 
I think here platforms are constrained by new rules in terms of how they make decisions. And sometimes the decisions are not even final in some sense. So that's the due process part. And the second part is then the part that focuses on risk mitigation. So that's the idea that um, platforms um, uh, and particularly the subset, the big ones, um, uh, very large online platforms and very large online search engines generate um, uh, large risks um, to society of various kinds and that there should be a way how to um, force these companies to think about these risks before they um, perhaps launch their products or uh, that they learn as they launch the products about the risks that the ecosystem is posing to, um, um, to, to others. So those are the main things now about the risk mitigation. I could, I could talk about it for a long time, but one thing I'd like to say is that compared to say other approaches in other countries, say an online safety bill, um, I think the bulk of risk mitigation measures um, and design expectations for the products and services, uh, the biggest part, biggest part, actually um, uh, concerns the, the biggest players. Um, and this is what the commission terms asymmetric regulation, right? This is also something we know from other areas. The idea that the bigness attracts the special responsibility. So I think this is what we can see also in the DSA. So the asymmetric approach is something that is shared across. Um, and um, yeah, we could talk a lot about this risk mitigation, what it will mean. Um, on the similarities, just broadly, I think what is similar um, between the DSA and the MA is exactly this, that the commission took uh, the sort of a tiered approach to its heart and that it didn't try to over-regulate the ecosystem uh, horizontally, but try to tier regulate specific tiers um, depending on the size of the company or the impact of the service. Now, whether that has worked, it caused not too much of regulation or under-regulation, I leave that uh, to the discussion. But, but I think for me, those are the two main components, risk mitigation for big guys particularly, and then uh, due process for the ecosystem as such. Thank you very much, Martin. Ilaria, uh, if, if I may ask you to, uh, to you, you were part, uh, and are still a part of this uh, DSA observatory, where you with your colleagues monitor the development, the evolution of, of the proposal from the proposal, or even the discussions uh, preceding the proposal, and to the final act and the, fu the functioning as such, what in your view is you know, the uh, several elements of the DSA which, which merit specific uh, comments in terms of its mission maybe and how effectively these ideas have been incorporated in the final, in the final proposal? Yes, um, uh, thanks again, Martin, for uh, the uh, wonderful um, and very uh, clear uh, overview uh, and synthesis uh, of an extremely um, complex and, and layered um, piece, piece of legislation. I really, um, I, I agree that uh, what's really um, new and important uh, in, in, uh, in the DSA from a regulatory perspective is um, the fact that it introduces um, due diligence uh, obligations for these online intermediaries, um, which are um, um, uh, balanced and follow a sort of a pyramidal uh, structure depending on their size and societal uh, relevance. And, and, and that uh, these due diligence obligations are, are separate um, uh, from uh, the, the question of liability e exemptions from their possible uh, um, liability for, for the behavior uh, of, of the users. Um, uh, also, as, as Martin uh, said, uh, a very crucial uh, aspect is that of systemic risk, uh, a novel concept that, uh, that I find extremely uh, interesting. Uh, it's open-ended. Uh, we'll learn more um, in the months and years to come about how this uh, uh, concept is to be uh, interpreted and operationalized uh, in practice. Um, 
one uh, one aspect of of the DSA um, that I also find extremely uh, interesting and central, and that has um, uh, undergone uh, quite a significant change uh, from the first proposal to the final text, is uh, the enforcement uh, chapter. Um, so um, it's clear here that the uh, conversation on enforcement uh, of, of the DSA um, has been uh, uh, influenced clearly, uh, in particular by the experience, uh, not clearly optimal with the uh, enforcement um, of, uh, of the GDPR. Um, so the enforcement model uh, opted for by, by the DSA um, has uh, the European Commission uh, as the central regulatory authority uh, with, with exclusive uh, uh, supervision and enforcement power for the, the biggest um, uh, platforms. Another um, uh, distinctive feature of, of the DSA enforcement uh, uh, chapter that I find uh, interesting is the introduction of uh, clear uh, deadlines uh, to, to make sure that um, uh, supervision and enforcement initiatives by the, by the commission, by the other national uh, supervisory authority uh, proceeds uh, swiftly. Um, and also when it comes to enforcement, uh, uh, we'll, we'll expand on, on, on this maybe later. Um, another interesting uh, aspect is that we see the, the DSA, a bit like the, the GDPR, uh, combines uh, dynamics of public um, enforcement, uh, which is what I've just mentioned, um, uh, with aspects of, of private enforcement. So um, we see that individuals and, and firms which uh, can claim that have suffered the damage as a result of um, the uh, breach, the non-performance of the obligations um, introduced under the, the DSA uh, can bring a claim uh, before the national court. And uh, the final text also um, introduces uh, a, a right to compensation and, and we will see how this, uh, uh, how this unfolds. So these are just some of the uh, aspects that I, that I found the most interesting, but um, I think we'll have time in the course of our conversation to expand on these and other uh, aspects of the DSA that I um, didn't mention right now. Indeed, thank you very much, Ilaria. Uh, Mark, if, if I may revert to, to you, uh, finishing with, with, the, 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 kind of, with the elements uh, highlighted by, by Ilaria about um, reporting mechanisms, maybe uh, you, you mentioned occasionally uh, at some point that um, it's, it could be problematic, it's not as self-evident that the mechanism of reporting is well calibrated and it, it will be kind of un, un, uh, kind of cloudless. Maybe if you can, if I can ask you to my, to, to to introduce your original your initial thoughts about the DSA and somehow link it with with this element as well. Thank you, Olus, and uh, thank you to both um, Martin and Delaria for their opening remarks. Um, it's interesting. I'll start off commenting on something Martin said because when I teach about platform regulation, I sort of look at this as being the fourth uh, wave of platform regulation. So the kind of move from uh, kind of self-regulating platforms to, okay, well, the law needs to intervene here because we can't have fully self-regulating platforms, which led to fragmentation across the member states and the pockets of law regarding regulating copyright and defamation and illegal content. And then a kind of move back to and the adoption of all these kind of three word catchphrases like notice and take down and notice and notice and notice and action and lawful but harmful content. And then now the new one is the um, freedom of speech and is not the same as freedom of reach. And um, my new favorite, which has entered the vernacular, is uh, lawful but awful. 
uh, content. And I, I, I like the way that the DSA is bringing out all these catchphrases, but I really think that's what it's about. Um, I think the DSA is uh, cognizant of the authors of the DSA are cognizant of the fact that user generated content on a whole uh, has a significantly more value uh, and upside than it has negative and harmful effects on society. Uh, but those negative effects can be amplified by the platforms and so they tend to be more um, in the spotlight uh, per se um, uh, of politicians and even users to understand the harm that comes from a very small percentage of lawful but awful content. Um, philosophically, I don't even know if that's the right word in this context, but I, I view transparency, uh, especially in the data protection sense, to be a bit misleading and also um, a bit of a challenge in the sense that, um, well, if transparency is a principle that we're going to rely on in the legal context, then what's the evidence that transparency brings about a change in behavior? Uh, and I've argued elsewhere that transparency doesn't necessarily, um, it, it certainly doesn't change anything in a data protection sense. People still don't read the privacy policies. They make bad uh, information regarding their data. Um, and so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the world of corporate governance and mandatory reporting align uh, through the DSA. Uh, let me give you an example of what I mean by this. It is not going to be in any platform's interest to be 100% open with the systemic risks that their platforms pose uh, to the larger information ecosystem. And so I would imagine that internally, many of the corporate governance checks that are operating inside a platform are going to be affected just how transparent and honest some platforms are. Um, it's not in Facebook's interest to be completely transparent about how, how many um, uh, child sexual abuse materials are floating around that platform or uh, how uh, fully private closed groups are stoking right-wing extremism, for example, on, on Facebook. Uh, it's never going to be uh, in Twitter's interest to be fully transparent about how it promotes and uh, amplifies certain content at the extent of others. Um, what I think the DSA does, and maybe this is the genius of it, is that by making these platforms be uh, go through this risk process and also be a little bit transparent about um, turning over certain information is that it gives civil society a role to play far beyond anything that was possible under the old, the first, second, or third wave of platform regulation. So the idea that civil society is going to have access to many of the documents that have been turned over, hopefully, uh, and can respond to uh, some of the information that's being provided by platforms, I think is going to create a different system of thinking about platforms and their impact on everything from human rights to children to um, the proliferation of disinformation in certain contexts. And the other thing that the DSA does, and I think Martin was very um, talked about this to a certain degree, but I'd, I'd like to look at it at a different angle, is uh, there's a procedural set of rules for for uh, users to challenge a decision about content. But the other side of that is it recognizes that some content is more dangerous than others. And it elevates the roles of people like trusted flaggers into the equation to prioritize a reaction from the platform over certain types of content, which I think is never been done in any other environment uh, legally. Maybe Martin can correct me on this, but um, the idea that a platform then has to prioritize a trusted flagger creates a new level of sort of editorial um, input into the ecosystem, which uh, certainly didn't exist under the e-commerce directive. And I think that has been underplayed 
uh, understated as the potential for thinking about how content is going to be um, viewed by platforms uh, in the new environment. Uh, and maybe we can talk about um, that a little bit further. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting and very really a kind of uh, rather unknown, at least for, for the area I come from, this mechanism of trusted flaggers. So um, basically we trust in societal kind of self-corrective mechanisms um, but obviously a kind of a, a darker side of me might ask whether the mechanism of trusted flaggers would be somehow, is it susceptible to being misused by the platform's main competitors, perhaps, who would somehow fuel some elements of problems, uh, challenge, uh, changing the, the, the objective landscape, so to say. And also before, before, before reverting to, to, to you, obviously our conversation envisages uh, more relaxed and uh, flexible for format. So please feel free to um, to comment on each other and cross reference to each other's points. Just yeah, I I, I think uh, I've always made a kind of had a back a joke in the back of my head that it's only a few years away before the EU passes a regulation on the trusted flaggers. I mean, we're it, it, there is always the risk that we can. That a group of people is politicized, and in fact, it's actually a conspiracy theory that trusted flaggers have a left-wing bias uh, already. So I can see that it's inevitable to a certain degree that trusted flaggers will be politicized, uh, and uh, as part of the discussion point uh, somewhere down the line um, in content moderation. Living. Uh, or, uh, staying within this kind of uh, political elements, if I can ask you, maybe Martin, uh, reverting back to you, um, we when we talk about the, the the DMA, we see the the main actors and their main interests. Often these interests are almost antagonistic, and because of the binary model of the DMA, where we have basically gatekeepers and the rest and uh, we don't have pyramidal structure within the DMA where it's more or less proportional. You mentioned the symmetric, but it still looks like the bigger you are, the more the, 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 the scope of obligation is symmetric to your size, more or less. The DMA is completely different. So maybe I can ask you the main stakes and the main stakeholders within, within this game and how impactful they, they were in, in, in channeling their messages and uh, again looking at the final product i think this is the this is the difficult bit about the dsa is the dsa <clears throat> is regulation that comes on top of the entire legal system um and why do i say that is because it's it's processes about enforcement of um <clears throat> of legal rules apply to basically anything that national parliaments and the European Parliament say is illegal. Um, so if you think about everything that is illegal in your country and think about all the issues that it somehow uh, involves, um, that is the scope of the DSA, basically, right? Um, and that is compounded if you get to the level of risk mitigation, where you have to really get mitigate risk for, again, all illegal content, a few singled out issues, and then fundamental rights such as uh, meaning that you can have any other fundamental rights potentially. So um, I guess the, the main message of the DSA is that it potentially applies to all the interests in society, which is a little bit the the risk I think they were running uh, is that um, we might be thinking about some challenges uh, the last couple of years, last 10 years told us about different challenges. I think it came kind of in waves, right? We had copyright problems, trademark problems, the sign language migration crisis, we had hate speech problems, then we had uh, terrorist content problems with ISIS, then suddenly we had um, this, uh, suddenly we had this information issues, war propaganda. So we're learning as we go. Um, I would actually say that we have become much more nuanced. Uh, uh, I, for instance, um, I think that disinformation as a challenge uh, improved our thinking about the problem um, because previously a lot of emphasis was put only on providers as the main player. And I think disinformation that 
totally falls apart because you know there's no way that you can solve it by going after one uh, set of players. Uh, it's the it's the ecosystem. So I think that these challenges will continue. So frankly, it, it depends. I don't know what problem society will develop. <laughs> I can tell you what the problems were up until now, and DSA reflects that pretty much like DMA, with a difference that DMA doesn't have a way to incorporate new uh, uh, new uh, approaches so flexibly as the DSA. Right? DSA is from the get-go very flexible um, about what comes up. So um, it's it's hard to say who the stakeholders are. Well, they're all the typical stakeholders we'll have had up until now. So from the industries that care about enforcement. Um, you know, copyright and related to um, all communities interested in enforcement of child abuse material, terrorist content, hate speech, all of these. Uh, I think the clearest trade-off is 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 trade-off between enforcement of rules and and freedom of expression. I think that's the biggest one. This underlying one, which is between enforcement of rules and privacy, um, and that has to do with the fact that many of these tools can be more invasive, less invasive. Uh, give more agency, less agency to impacted individuals, whether they're children, parents, and stuff. So I think many of these sort of um, conflicting um, uh, conflicting challenges, but um, it's it's hard to to state in abstract, to be to be honest. Um, which is, I think, why it's probably hard to um, to oppose it because you can articulate one interest, but or one instance, not necessarily the the full uh, breadth and reach of these rules. Um, which is my baby DMA was subject to much more. And also it's more close to the business um, of, of these companies, right? Uh, DSA is a cost, it's a compliance issue. Uh, DMA is the, is, the, is the income side of things, isn't it? Indeed, when you, when you mention compliance, we currently see in the, in the discussion within the DMA uh, on the costs of compliance and the mechanisms of compliance. Mm. I can only imagine that within DMA with much broader scope of addressees, the issue of compliance uh, plays even, even, even greater role. And we will re re revert to compliance. But I, I, I wanted to ask you, Ilaria, maybe, um, obviously we, we know that per, the structure is pyramidal, but still we have a category of platforms, very large online platforms and very large uh, search engines added pretty much last minute, or not last, last minute, but uh, as far as I remember, this the, the later one was not present in the original version of the DSA. <clears throat> and they are kind of bestowed with or designated with uh, strong requirements about risk assessment and risk management. Can you uh, highlight the logic of it and uh, implications maybe? Um, yes, uh, indeed, as you as you said, uh, the <clears throat> very large uh, online search engines uh, uh, were not mentioned uh, in the first proposal and uh, entered the debate um, at a certain point, I think around the time of the uh, Council's uh, general approach. Um, indeed, the, the, the risk management uh, uh, obligations are really uh, the uh, uh, the cornerstone of the uh, section uh, of the DSA, which is applicable to the uh, biggest uh, platforms and uh, online search engines, uh, what what the DSA requires them to do is to assess uh, periodically, at least once a year, um, the systemic risks. Uh, again, a very interesting, uh, complex, open-ended um, uh, concept, systemic risks, which are associated uh, with the functioning and the use of their, uh, of their services, and to adopt a series of measures um, uh, which uh, have to be appropriate uh, to mitigate uh, these, uh, these risks. Um, this uh, um, notion of uh, systemic risks is really novel to the DSA. Uh, it's a broad category of, of risks, uh, which includes um, uh, dissemination of, of illegal content, then uh, actual or foreseeable um, negative effects uh, on all uh, fundamental rights um, uh, mentioned under the charter, potentially, um, 
And then um, the DSA says, in particular, and lists uh, a couple of uh, uh, fundamental rights which are in particular uh, uh, implicated, such as freedom of expression, uh, privacy and data protection, the rights of uh, the child, uh, the right to not uh, be discriminated. Um, and then um, what the, 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 the large and light platforms also have to um, take into account is uh, negative effects um, on a series of um, particularly relevant uh, uh, societal uh, issues. Uh, so um, notably a civil uh, discourse, the, uh, uh, the integrity uh, of the electoral processes, uh, public security, health, uh, the protection from uh, gender-based uh, violence, uh, public health and, and, and minors. Um, and, and there's a, a series of uh, mitigating measures um, which have to be uh, adopted uh, that typically consist of um, uh, redesigning uh, their uh, recommender systems and their uh, algorithmic decision making in general, um, readapting, uh, adjusting their uh, content moderation um, and uh, also their advertising systems and rules. Uh, revising terms and conditions, and um, more in general, also um, uh, adapting their investments in the um, uh, human resources that are dedicated to the um, so-called uh, trust and safety um, uh, teams. Um, so um, the, the DSA has opted for this uh, technique of, um, in a way, uh, uh, listing uh, precisely the type of uh, uh, issues uh, that might be um, posing, might be, uh, yeah, posing a, a, a systemic risk. Um, and at the same time also has adopted this very open-ended uh, uh, phrasing. So all, um, um, actual or foreseeable uh, negative effects on uh, all fundamental rights. Um, we'll see how these uh, play out in practice. Um, um, I think it will be very, um, very interesting, very relevant to see um, uh, the, the guidance that will come um, from, from the commission, but also from uh, the national uh, supervisory authority, which will be um, cooperating uh, between them and uh, cooperating in the context of the board and with the commission in signaling a possible uh, um, uh, problems uh, with, the, with the systemic risks um, and, and see how this will be uh, operationalized in practice, because there are many uh, aspects uh, that are uh, unclear at the moment. Um, uh, I would say the main one probably uh, relates to audits, uh, which are clearly um, directly related to uh, risk assessment and mitigation. So the, the, the big platforms must uh, submit um, their um, risk reports to these independent uh, auditors. Uh, the requirements um, of independence of the auditors have been uh, a bit strengthened throughout the DSA political uh, process. Um, uh, and then the auditors will um, uh, draw up an audit report uh, which includes an opinion, uh, so it either positive, uh, positive with comments or, or negative uh, as to the level of compliance of, of the services with the, with the DSA. Um, a number of, of uh, very significant questions uh, remain open uh, on, on audits. Um, um, and all these questions are clearly very central um, to questions of uh, risk, uh, systemic risk assessment and, and mitigation. Um, one one, one uh, uh, very prominent aspect relates to the fact that the auditing uh, 
provisions are very uh, unspecific uh, on the auditing uh, methodology uh, and on in some way on the substantial tasks of, of the auditors. So it remains unclear if you read um, um, uh, the current um, uh, uh, provision on audits whether uh, the auditor are simply expected to, to, to sort of uh, rubber stamp the assessment, which is um, uh, in the end a self-assessment made by the platforms, um, or if they are um, instead uh, required to, to go much deeper, to reopen this assessment, to uh, uh, in the end, reperform uh, the uh, the assessment uh, uh, presented by um, by the platforms, uh, which, as as uh, Mark noted, uh, clearly have an interest in uh, also um, limiting the, uh, the the depth and and the breadth of of uh, this this risk assessment. Um, so it's it's difficult to uh, to say uh, on how this um, how this how this uh, auditing uh, provision will be interpreted. Uh, in the end, um, uh, we we can consider that that the complexity uh, very realistically the, the the complexity of the platforms environment and their systems is such um that um in the end the auditing might end up uh being uh a bit more uh superficial uh than an, a total reassessment reopening uh of all the evaluations and and conclusions uh but it's clear that uh this type of interpretation would inevitably um uh, deprive the auditing uh, uh provisions uh, and the all uh, risk uh, management uh, uh architecture of, of much of its uh, teeth but on on this provision again on auditing um there will be a delegated act uh, to be adopted soon by the Commission. Uh, I think the Commission is expected to, to publish the, a draft of these delegated acts and to open the consultation um, uh, procedure in the coming weeks. And hopefully um, uh, all of part of the questions that I was just raising uh, will be um, um, addressed by this uh, guidance and, um, and new act. Based upon what Alaria just said, this is an area where it's, an, it's I imagine it's gonna be largely unknown or we're, we don't know, we have an expectation of what the DSA is trying to do or maybe an understanding of what the DSA is trying to do, but we don't have experience yet on whether it is going to be successful in creating a healthier information ecosystem, largely because of the the, the adoption of the phrases like systemic risks um, and the adoption of these kind of risk assessment measures to put into platforms in a way that has an output which can be manipulated for good and bad and under certain circumstances, but at the same time creates a framework of understanding about thinking about the potential for what might happen on your platform. And that has merit in itself, but I don't necessarily buy into the idea that the DSA is going to magically get platforms to uh, be able to mitigate all of the systemic risks that are uh, endemic on the nature of every platform that falls under that label of uh, VLOP. Excellent. Um, Martin, if I can ask you, um, speaking of the architecture of the DSA, and we, we see elements of public enforcement and private enforcement, we see another dimension, the relationship between the Commission and member states, there are special authorities designed by the DSA. Can you just shed some light on, 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 the, on this mechanism? 
the TSA um, regulation focuses mostly on public enforcement side, which does not necessarily mean that other enforcement is not possible. And on the contrary, I, I think that private enforcement is possible, not all of all provisions of the DSA, but um, of many. Um, the public enforcement is structured. I mean, it's fifty percent of the of the DSA is about uh, obviously about enforcement. Um, in a similar way, as uh, probably fifty percent of the provisions in the GDPR are about uh, uh, governance and uh, and enforcement. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I mean you have rightly stated that because of the um, uh, I think it was Ilaria who mentioned this because of the um, learning in the area of GDPR. Um, some member states were hesitant to uh, go for the country of origin principle and the country of establishment. And as a result, for the very large online platforms, um, the European Commission receives a special exclusive competence, actually. Um, now, <clears throat> here it also a little bit depends on what obligations are we talking about. Are we talking about the special obligation, what I call special obligations? Obligations that are only given to um, the um, uh, VLOPs and bosses, um, those are on the special competence of the European Commission. And when it comes to the other obligations that um, that these companies, the very large online uh, platforms and very large online services have, it, it, it depends a little bit on the of the nature of uh, of the infringement. So, for systemic infringement is the is the Commission sharing the powers. Uh, for non-systemic infringement of non-special obligations, it's basically the member states. And then for everything else, by anyone else, it's the member states mm, based on the country of origin. So it's a little bit, um, it's sort of again graduated. I think the main thing for the audience that wouldn't know what type of obligations they are, it's important that the special obligations, the risk mitigation, the big risk mitigation that we have just discussed is in the, um, in the hands of the European Commission. Uh, but some aspects of their compliance with the DSA are also in the hands of the member states, um, unless commission exercises power, and some of them are in the hands of member states um, in, in general. And then most of the ecosystem is then with the uh, runs under the regular European approach of, uh, of country of establishment, uh, with some attempts to uh, coordinate the enforcement. Now, I think the big thing that is not resolved too much or addressed too much in the GDP, sorry, in GDPR and DSA, is the is the issue of private enforcement. And um, in my personal view is that many DSA obligations, due diligence obligations, actually also create individual rights. Not all of them. Uh, one, for instance, that doesn't create individual rights is the risk mitigation special obligation of very large online platforms. The reason for that is for me that's a regulatory dialogue rather than a right that is conferred upon an individual. But there are many, many due diligence obligations that, in my view, uh, confer rights on individuals. But where you can enforce it and, and, and through what means depends on the national law. Um, and uh, DSA has one provision about damages, which is make sure that that. Um, there's always a requirement of damages um, materializing and a causal uh, causal link. But um, you don't really learn much more about this, so it's up to the national law. One thing there is there, though, actually two things. One is a representation, so there's a special provision on representation. Um, so, for instance, if you are a YouTuber, you can get yourself represented by uh, by a specialized um, organization to represent you in the disputes and uh, and help you with the resolving of disputes. But the bigger one um, is um, is the creation of injunctive relief for uh, consumer associations um, for violations of the DSA. Um, and that, that can be quite interesting because that could mean that uh, actually the first private enforcement I see is a collective action by the um, uh, consumer um, organizations. Um, but there are other type of private enforcement uh, tools that might be possible, which I think uh, uh, we will see. And unlike in the DMA context, or maybe partly also in the DMA context, I think the DSA, a lot of private enforcement will also happen through the contract, uh, contract law, because uh, many of these uh, relationships between content creators and um, platforms are relationships between contractual parties. Uh, the difference was that they just didn't have any pr proper rights up until now, because contract law allowed them to basically um, um, uh, contract away most of it. 
but uh, Benali say superimposes some uh, some expectations. So I think that will be another interesting uh, debate about how contracts and contractual relationships and contractual disputes will change between these two parties. So I think there's a lot. Um, th there's a lot in terms of the private enforcement as well. So I'm not so um, I'm not so worried about there not being enough uh, uh, avenues for enforcement. Of course, the one um, that we have to see what the particularly what the commission does. Um, with it is the risk mitigation because that's a exclusive competence. And again, as I said, I don't think you can uh, enforce it much privately unless the commission already made a decision about the non-compliance, in which case I could imagine some private enforcement to collect images, but that's a, that's a very special case. This is quite a risk, uh, quite, quite an elegant way, actually, to design the formula which uh, doesn't create rights while allow you to, to intervene as a public enforcer pretty much in the open-ended uh, fashion. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a part of the design. It's a not uh, it's it's a really a dialogue provision. It's an iterative process. Uh, I think on purpose you have um, the auditors um, involved before you have the commission is because there's a clear understanding that the commission doesn't know either. And after commission, uh, you have the researchers who are sort of uh, uh, looking uh, over the shoulder of everyone else. So it's really a very iterative process, which is why I think it's uh, maybe much more iterative than the, you know than anything we know in competition law, where there's also the fact finding. Um, which is why I'm I'm reserved, for instance, uh, to suggest it should be private enforcement of uh, risk mitigation obligations, uh, because I think it's more about a dialogue um, and and a byproduct of the dialogue. But of course, if you have individual decisions saying you have violated X duty. And people are harmed. I could imagine follow-on enforcement of that, but um, but yeah. So it's a it's a different as as you argue in your article about the DMA, <laughs> which we argue that there's no private enforcement of the DMA. Which you seem to also agree that that's a minority view. Uh, um, at least that's my understanding from reading parts of your article. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Martin. My 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 proposition was much less, you know, ambitious. I was saying that I acknowledge that there is a private enforcement, but it it it's there for the wrong reason. I, okay. I don't dispute the the presence of Article Forty Two in okay. the DMA, but also direct applicable direct effectiveness of some uh, obligations of Article Five in particular, but not only. Mm -hmm. uh, Ilaria. Um, what, what do you think? What is your view about the, 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 the role of private enforcement, but also maybe public enforcement? Uh, we, we have, I don't know how familiar the DSA, uh, ex how experienced we are with the, within the DSA cluster about uh, the, the mechanism of commitments, because it, it looks that it comes from, from competition law, ex post competition, Revelation 1003. Uh, so that, that, is it something which raised the, the eyebrow in, 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 in the community of DSA scholars? Um, what are your view on on the on the private enforcement and, and public enforcement of the DSA? Um, yeah, I have to say I have looked in particular um, in my work at the uh, uh, unfolding of these uh, enforcement chapter in the DSA. So I focus in particular on aspects of um, uh, public. Uh, enforcement um, and uh, how the um, uh, division, the configuration of competencies uh, shaped up uh, in the DSA debate and, and why, for which political reasons. I, I followed with great interest also the dynamics that um, played out between uh, member states uh, at some point uh, in the fall of uh, 2021, uh, uh, with France and other countries wanting to overcome the, the country of origin principles and, and, and pushing for the, the country of destination having more uh, competences. And then the debate landed um, on these um, uh, on this solution of the uh, commission being the central regulatory authority for the big platforms and having exclusive competence for uh, the most important um, uh, due diligence uh, obligations which are exclusively applicable to uh, to them what uh, martin calls the, the special uh, obligations 
Um, one, one aspect that I think um, has been uh, a bit under discussed, I, I think it's, it's uh, absolutely a positive uh, move uh, that towards uh, more centralization. But I think one aspect that has been a bit also under discussed is um, whether the um, commission really is the ideal uh, uh, actor um, uh, to, to perform this, this role. Um, so, and I think this is a, a discussion that is worth having, particularly has some calls for more centralizations are also taking place in the de data protection, GDPR um, uh, debate. Um, so I think indeed it's, it's a positive step, but uh, one thing is the uh, commission, the executive power of, um, of the EU. And one thing is a, a centralized uh, EU independent agency. I think it's uh, two different things. And uh, um, there are some aspects here that are worth maybe uh, uh, discussing more, particularly if this uh, role and characterization of the uh, European Commission as enforcer is a characterization and role that is going to uh, come back also in other uh, forthcoming uh, uh, legislation. What, what I know is um, just that, as I said, in, in the autumn of 2021, um, uh, these really became a, a battleground, one of the main ones in the uh, DSA political debate. And so France, together with all the other major uh, EU member states, uh, pushed for uh, overcoming the um, um, uh, country of origin principles. And uh, another, I think, 10 member states headed by um, Ireland uh, were insisting that um, no, we needed to, to respect and to apply again uh, the uh, country of origin principle as, as, as we know it. Um, this was going to be a major hurdle towards um, uh, progressing um, in, the, in the negotiation and um, this idea of, of the commission that probably was already uh, somehow in the air um, uh, materialized. Um, and, and also the commission has, has experience as an enforcer in, in other areas, uh, the competition, and uh, um, at the same time that the DSA was presented, the DMA was also presented um, uh, where um, uh, the, the commission has, has a major role. Uh, so this probably um, also uh, informed the, the DSA debate. Uh, that, that's what I can uh, imagine. Okay, let me let me then reflect on on, on this point because Ilaria, for me, it, it, it is an important uh, or not for all of us it's important, but for me it's also kind of the issue which I was thinking quite quite a lot. Probably coming from the minority camp, which would say that the fact, in response to Mark's point, that the Commission doesn't have experience, that we are entering into a completely new modality where no, it's kind of learning by doing, and it's kind of experimental, all this kind of regulatory sandbox story that nobody knows what to do, how to do it properly. Um, but we need this kind of centralized enforcement because, because this is a very political issue and because there is no clear cut matrix kind of axioms which we have to comply with, uh, uh, comply with in order to maintain the order. It's kind of constantly evolving mechanism where the political interests of the, of the entity of the European Union as such uh, plays a so important role, designating it to an independent uh, agency, which would be driven by observing exclusively the obligations uh, of uh, the, the intermediaries and platforms, would risk somehow, uh, obviously, depoliticizing the story. But I don't know if it would be for good or bad. This is an interesting that why, why this model was chosen as opposed to adopting the EDPB model, the consensus mechanism, bringing all the digital services coordinator together and uh, and using that approach rather than um, bringing the commission in. It, I'm sure there's valid reasons and, it's, and it will play out well, 
but uh, I think it's just an interesting way that we're still trying to find our feet here, so to speak, with testing these different models uh, of enforcement when it comes to digital technologies. So, um, but uh, thank you to Ilaria for enlightening me. I didn't know that. Yeah, my apologies for a little bit uh, uh, not not even noticing that uh, that question. So uh, I think uh, I agree. I mean, I, I think the risk is clear that the commission might not uh, be resourced well, even if they have good intentions, might be not resourced well, which uh, <clears throat> we compare with the, what the online safety bill is preparing for. <clears throat> it seems like uh, they should be hiring more people, at least comparatively. Um, so that is a risk, right? You, you, you run it if you uh, entrust um, it entirely or to a great extent with the, with the commission. I think my sense is that um, uh, there was a, there was an attempt to resolve the problem of uh, you know some member states that might try to uh, lure and and under enforce, and um, the only way to avoid that is to centralize. Uh, and yes, you could centralize with an agency, but the problem of centralizing with an agency is that you have to agree where the agency will be based. Uh, and that's something that slows down the process tremendously. So if you want an interim step, I guess this is it. Uh, maybe there might be emancipation in, uh, in, the, next, in the next generation of rules um, in the update of the DSA. But I kind of understand if they wanted to push this very quickly, and they did push it quite quickly, right, both the DMA and DSA. Um, and look, online safety bill has been debated for four or five years now, and it's been dead and revived and dead and revived. So uh, I think I think if uh, if you wanted those rules to be adopted very quickly, I, I don't think you want to be discussing the place of agency um, and all these other things that change the dynamics. So I do understand uh, why they're interested with the commission. Uh, as, as a solution, centralization is a solution, but I, I do also do agree that, that there are these risks that a commission might be understaffed, particularly under resource. I think the intentions, I'm certainly not in, uh, uh, seeing uh, bad intentions, though you have to always secure yourself against the, prop against the possibility that uh, you know, that might change in the future, might, be, might become more political. So I, I clearly agree that uh, I, I was also in favor of, a, of an independent agency. Um, but I also understand that you want to maybe change the law or learn and incrementally sort of build up the, the infrastructure. So, so, so that, that, I, uh, that I fully understand. Um, yeah. Sorry, Mark, for not immediately responding to this one. Let me, Mark, continue <laughs> with you, if, if I may. Uh, we know that the, the proposal uh, was changed on several occasions, and it's somehow it's not the same as it was at the beginning. And one of the dif one of the differences in the final product is the emphasis on the discussion on on dark patterns or black patterns. It's a kind of uh, we obviously understand the the, the logic of, of of dark patterns that our conduct is being unknown, shaped in so many instances. Our online behavior so to say uh, can you elucidate on this are you optimistic about the final product with the, the with, with dark patterns and uh, what are the implications are there a side effects maybe of this um okay so let's let's start with saying what a dark pattern is for those that are watching this a dark pattern is a technique that has been used by a designer to bring about an outcome that would uh, benefit the platform at the expense of the user or the autonomy of the user. Most dark patterns we think of, or the research into dark patterns uh, over the last couple of years is really focused on tricking people or, or using a design technique to manipulate people into signing a privacy or agreeing to terms and conditions uh, uh, or agreeing to a privacy policy to begin the processing of personal data. Uh, there's a smaller subset of dark patterns or a different uh, set of dark patterns, which are related to the idea of consumers and getting consumers to agree to the terms and conditions or sneaking things into their basket and forcing them into a transaction uh, that might go against their economic interests. Now, um, I, I view dark patterns a little bit differently now because uh, I've been working on this for the past few years, as you as you all know. Um, 
but dark patterns are normally seen by academics and researchers as existing in the online interface. And um, there are design techniques that are visible to people. And uh, I think this is a mistake. I think what we're seeing now is that there's more design techniques um, being implemented inside the system architecture. And uh, when you speak to designers, what they'll tell you quite openly is that when you're building a system or you're building an interface for users, maybe change the wording here, when you're building a product or an app, you start at the bottom and you work your way up. And so that the online interface is literally the last thing that you put on there, right? If you're building a house, you build the foundations, you build the wood, the infrastructure, and then the bricks go on last and the roof and everything goes on top. If that's maybe a bad metaphor or an, or, or an analogy that explains it, a lot of the dark patterns we're seeing now are implemented in the foundations of the house. And if you look at the wording of the DSA, it specifically mentions uh, the online interface inside, uh, I think it's Article 25. Uh, maybe, is it Article 25? Um, of, the, of the DSA. Uh, specifically is about uh, dark patterns. The good news is that if you look at the, uh, the wording of the DSA, if you look at the wording of 25, there is a little bit of uh, um, uh, light at the end of the dark tunnel, pardon the pun here, um, because you have to read 25 in um, relation to recital 67. And what uh, recital 67 says about halfway down is that uh, uh, any uh, providers of online platforms should therefore be prohibited from deceiving or nudging recipients of the service and from distorting or impairing the autonomy decision making or choice of the recipients of the service via the structure, design, or functionalities of an online interface or a part thereof. And I'm arguing in a paper, um, I'm also going to be talking about this on a panel uh, with Martin and uh, Harry Brignall, who coined the term uh, dark patterns, that there's light there to make the argument that the, the wording of Article 25 might be problematic. No designer speaks in the language that you see in Article 25. But because you can apply it to the functionalities through Recital 67, that you can start thinking about everything that is underneath the surface. And so the iceberg is visible. That's what Article 25 appears to be limited to regulate. But Recital 67 gives you the opening to go beneath the surface and look at how you get to the interface. And then when you combine that with the kind of manipulation clauses or articles of the AI Act, if I know that you are more susceptible to agreeing to something if a, if a button is yellow, right? And not because of profiling, that's all part of a dark pattern. If I then present you an interface that happens to have a yellow button on it, and that yellow button is specific to you, then that is a dark pattern that isn't just there in the interface, it's also beneath the surface in, in the bulk of the application uh, that is being used to manipulate you to, do, to, to doing something that isn't. So where the, where is the work, the, the work that we're doing now is on this point, trying to make the argument that Article 25, in light of Recital 67, should be for regulating dark patterns below the visible online interface, that it's not just about what you can see, but it's about the mechanisms that permit what you can see. Is it, do you think it's even possible to, to, to have such an ambitious expectation from, from the, in, in the DMA, what we have a, a, novel, a, a new a interesting mechanism is anti-circumvention provision, where basically you say, okay, I comply with the letter of law, put on me a very long catalog of obligations, I will comply with all of them, but still I will reach, I will find another way to reach the same result, complying with the letter, you, but then the, the, the DMA Article 14 captures this saying, no, you cannot do this. So it looks to me quite similar that what you propose here, do, are you optimistic about the, the, the enforceability of such obligation? 
Uh, I am. And Article 6.2 of the DMA and Recital 70 of the DMA also mention dark patterns. I mean, these are this is something that is, it's not just a one-off thing that's being thrown off. It also appears uh, in the new um, behavioral guidance that's put out by the European Commission on the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. I believe there's a clause inside the Data Act uh, on dark patterns. Obviously, the EDPB and the European Data Protection Supervisor have been putting new guidance out about cookie banners and dark patterns. So I, I do think that there is a shift change in thinking about the role design plays in getting users to do something and the power imbalances that are created in the anti-competitive effects that come with dark patterns. And there's, there does seem to be even some mechanisms that could be used by competitors to say, hey, this is an anti-competitive mechanism. We're playing by the rules, but my competitor isn't. Uh, and uh, obviously, um, another colleague of mine is working on a, well, how do you measure this? How do you measure user response in, in relation to dark patterns, which I think is going to be really, really uh, important to understand um, how users actually respond to the different design techniques within a particular platform or application. The other thing that's happening is because you have the designers who are being schooled in these kind of techniques, there's a whole class of now design ethicists which are trying to combat dark patterns by sort of revealing these techniques. I think that the DSA, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, um, potentially some aspects of the GDPR um, might work together to create the threshold of professional diligence. And so if designers are working in, in a way that, um, you know, is a good design practice that doesn't manipulate users, that's going to become the standard in which people are measured against. So it might not be that the DSA solves the problem, but I don't think that dark patterns can be solved by any sing one single piece of legislation or regulation. And uh, I, I wrote a book chapter called Regulatory Pluralism and the Need for it in order to regulate dark patterns, where I tried to make this argument that we need to lean on different regimes to, to make up from the shortcomings of one uh, to benefit the other. And uh, I still think that that, is, that argument is more apropos today than it was you know, a few years ago when I wrote that, that chapter. Um, is, it, is it something that the DSA is magically going to fix overnight? No, because I think what we're still focused on or what a lot of people are focused on is the visible part of the iceberg. And I think we need to move that conversation down to say, well, we've got this whole thing that is driving what you see up top. Uh, and the DSA does give us a little bit of leeway to getting there. It's just we need to be creative with this interpretation, and hopefully uh, we can influence uh, the commission and the, the digital coordinators in looking beyond just the online interface. Very interesting, amazing. Ilaria, I re re recollect you were quite, quite vocal about dark patterns as well during the, the discussion, uh, or you were observing many changes uh, from the D DSA uh, point, 0 0.1 to the DSA 1.0. Um, what in your view, maybe a dark pattern, maybe something else which, which, which deserves specific attention and comments? All in all, uh, I would say that the, the D DSA proposal uh, um, made it to the end uh, pretty much unchanged. Uh, on, in all its major um, aspects and elements. Um, well, one aspect we haven't uh, mentioned yet is that of uh, advertising. That was one of the most uh, heated uh, topics in the in the DSA um, uh, debate. Uh, at some point, there were calls for uh, banning uh, tracking-based ads, uh, surveillance-based ads. There was a coalition in the parliament um, that was uh, um, uh, uh, calling for these. Uh, and, and before that, there were three resolutions of the European parliament before the presentation of the commission's proposal from October uh, um, 2020, uh, which were also um, uh, strongly calling for uh, a more radical approach 
uh, towards uh, uh, the uh, tracking based ads and, and related uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, in the end, the DSA landed um, uh, with uh, uh, sort of an intermediate uh, approach. So introduce a prohibition uh, of serving ads uh, which are based on um, uh, profiling, which uses sensitive data um, as defined under GDPR and also uh, prohibition to use data of minors uh, for, for the same purposes. This is one uh, um, uh, remarkable uh, change. Um, through the through the DSA debate, another uh, which has quite a lot of potential, uh, I think, is um, Article Thirty Eight on recommender systems. Uh, so we have in the final text an obligation for the very large online platforms to offer at least one option uh, uh, for the recommender systems, which is not based on profiling. And um, this, this provision was not uh, phrased in the same way in the initial text. It was a possibility, but not uh, an obligation to, to offer this type of um, option for, for the users. Um, other, um, other changes we have not talked about, well, the introduction of a supervisory fee, for example, for um, uh, the uh, very, large, very large online platforms and online search engines to contribute to the costs of uh, the uh, commission uh, supervising them. Um, uh, the crisis response mechanism, Article 36. Um, there was already in the first, um, uh, uh, in, in the initial proposal, uh, a provision on um, uh, voluntary uh, crisis protocols, but um, uh, we can say the um, uh, political context, the start of the war in Ukraine in particular, uh, inspired the introduction of these um, a uh, new uh, provision on a uh, crisis response mechanism, uh, which, which allows the, the commission um, to, adopt, uh, the, to, to adopt a decision requiring the, the big uh, platforms to um, assess uh, if and how their services are contributing uh, to uh, a serious threat to public uh, order, uh, public security, public security or public health uh, in a situation uh, of crisis. Um, so it's it's another um, uh, uh, provision with uh, potentially big uh, implications, especially as in the future we go towards um, times of uh, uh, systemic and interrelated uh, crisis. So this uh, mechanism uh, could end up being used uh, um, uh, more than expected, uh, potentially. Um, um, if we go into an extended um, uh, situation of, of uh, and, and systemic uh, situation of crisis. Um, Another another uh, provision we have not mentioned yet, which is very, very important in the DSA, is access to data for researchers. Um, we'll see how that play out in practice. Uh, we will not see anything until at least uh, 2024 when the digital services coordinators are uh, appointed. Uh, one remarkable uh, change from the uh, initial proposal to the final text is that um, uh, the entity that has the last word in uh, vetting the researchers is the digital services coordinator uh, of establishment. Uh, so we are talking mainly of, of Ireland, uh, while in the first text, um, it seemed that the commission could also have a say in this uh, vetting process. Oh, I, I had a question regarding recommender systems. Um, I, I think as an objective observer, the, the provision regulating recommender systems are actually one of the weakest parts of the DSA. Uh, so I wanted to ask the, the three of you um, to comment on this. 
Uh, Olus, I'd also like you to, to think about the role of recommender systems in relation to competition law and the DMA, because one of the things that is being heralded as innovative in the DMA is interoperability requirements. And uh, I was thinking about, for those of you that are not familiar with the recommender system clause, it says you have to provide an option which doesn't rely on profiling, which it, to me is very weak. I mean, it doesn't say it has to be default. It doesn't say it has to be, you know, you know, visible or or a primary kind of choice in a design. It just says that you have to be, you know, relatively. You have to give provide that option. Um, and then I think there's another article that says you have to be transparent with users about why the recommender is making certain things. Now, in late in a platform like Netflix. You know, for somebody like me who only speaks English, the reason why I get the choices that I do is based upon the fact that I can't speak another language and I have a viewing history or I have a, a track record of, of things uh, that I have chosen on Netflix. When it comes to something like YouTube, it gets a little bit more complicated. And when it comes to something like Facebook, it becomes even more complicated. Um, about why I'm seeing certain choices or why I'm seeing certain people's stories uh, or certain stories at the expense of others. Um, and Facebook has always had that ability to kind of allow people the chronological time order as opposed to a kind of free Facebook. But, you know, it, it, they change it back the first time you leave the platform. It's a mechanism that does. And I, I really thought that there was an opportunity for the DSA to say, no, here you give people chronological results by default and then let them choose their um, what their news feeds might look like and give user autonomy but the DSA doesn't do that which is a little bit disappointing with regards to operability in the DMA is this then by design an opportunity for interoperability requirements to be imposed on content moderation or or content selection so if i don't want to see hate speech if i want if i don't want to see um uh right wing stuff i could have a set in my device content moderation policy which is through interoperability requirements applied at facebook applied at twitter applied at um reddit or any other platform that i use and do you see the dma possibly kind of doing content moderation by default through interoperability requirements, or is that just somewhere else down the line? I think uh, I understand, and I generally, well, I think probably that's the less ambitious part. I think I, I agree with that. Um, but, um, you know, most people who thought that this should be ambitious, more ambitious, ask for defaults, right? I don't think the faults are off the table because you still have risk mitigation measures coming on top. So I don't see a problem with the commission arguing ever a point that uh, given the risks as they are demonstrated on a particular platform, it's not enough to provide a choice, but you need to provide choice X or you need to provide uh, a default choice X, right? So I, I think that that is still possible. Um, I, it's, I don't think it's off the table, it's just not prescribed. Um, I guess one thing to keep in mind is that this also applies to all kinds of other recommended systems, uh, such as all marketplaces, right? Um, so we always think about social media um, and 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 and, um, and that type of um, that type of platforms. But if you think about overall on marketplaces, uh, uh, I think there are more uh, interesting questions to ask. Uh, why is it that chronological? Uh, I mean, sorry. Why is it that it is non-profiling based, where particularly from for online uh, platforms that are marketplaces, it would, for instance, be very interesting uh, to have as the obvious first option, so for instance, price-based comparison, right? Which some platforms uh, might be hiding from you increasingly um, because if they become very popular, they don't want you anymore to properly pro uh, compare on prices. So, but not non-profiling based could also be chronological, could be all many things, not necessarily price based, right? Comparison. Um, so I think particularly when it comes to online marketplaces, there are quite interesting um, problems there that are very different from social media when it comes to recommended systems. And here, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that 
here the DMA obviously meets uh, DSA and both of them meet uh, P2B, <laughs> platform to business regulation. So you have suddenly regulation of transparency of recommender systems on online marketplaces through DSA, platform to business regulation, uh, DMA partly, and regulation of self-referencing through platform to business regulation and DMA. Um, so and, and plus you have risk mitigation through the DSA. So there's a tons of stuff that can happen between these three instruments um, uh, if you think about it. So I think it's, I'm actually not too disturbed by this. I mean, yes, I agree. It's not very ambitious. At the same time, you can make arguments this is about online, about online platforms, online marketplaces, tons of different platforms all have many different issues. If you come up with one default, I think you, you certainly find something where it's going to be strange uh, to, to use that default, right? So I kind of understand the hesitation, but yes, it's less ambitious. And it probably doesn't change the behavior if you go for this. The second question I think is really, really interesting. And this is what I thought Olesh uh, might be really interested in, uh, uh, because this is kind of between the interface between the DMA and DSA. Um, I haven't seen uh, people discussing so far. And I, I've been reminded of this when I saw this announcement by Apple and to uh, allow uh, that is preparing for the basically uh, for the new uh, for, for the fact that there will be new uh, app stores that might operate on its um, on its operating system, and the question how they will moderate these apps. So uh, as you know, up until now, Apple has been exercising their kind of a moderation. Uh, muscle quite a bit when it comes to platform sequences. At some point, kick Parler, this, this Trump uh, promoting a social network on the basis of the user generated content is not sufficiently policed. So, this was a, this was a contractual provision in, in, the, um, in the developers' agreement with the developers of apps. Now, if they lose control of that, because now they can only enforce a few things, such as security. So, there are, I think, two different provisions in the DMA uh, uh, integrity. And then the second one is, I think, security doesn't say uh, uh, so much of whom. So I think the interesting bit becomes like, how much can you guarantee on that basis? So how far can Apple go in saying this is unsafe app for the ecosystem? Um, and I mean, we can all think about like all kinds of frauds um, inducing and, and um, uh, apps that that we would probably agree on, but will we still agree on Parler being part of the essence of the requirement uh, or not? So, so yes, I think, Mark, I think this is a really interesting question. I think the question really becomes what DMA allows to impose in terms of content moderation as the minimum on um, on the ecosystem. And clearly it means that the DSA, is, sorry, that Apple loses part of its uh, power to moderate uh, what is entering the ecosystem. Now, at the same time, you know, these new app stores are becoming regulatory targets, right? Because they are online platforms, they are marketplaces, just not very large online platforms. So, you know, uh, it's, it's, they are better off than, than Apple, at least unless they become popular. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I see that conversation. And I also see that conversation, by the way, in the context of um, uh, messaging apps, because now the big debate will be about interoperability of the messaging. And of course, messaging apps, unless they uh, also involved uh, storage of information, um, have less of a problem with content moderation, though they can have content moderation measures uh, there as well. Um, but once they engage in, and uh, once they have storage and in addition, public channels, these features can also become online platforms, in which case the question becomes, uh, how do you deal with that and interoperability of this? And how does they, uh, how does they interact with the, uh, with the basic requirements um, when it comes to interoperability of the messaging apps. So I think that's that's a really fascinating uh, a debate. I haven't seen uh, people looking into this. I hope um, that this will be subject to uh, discussion in the coming uh, coming months and years because it's, it's it's fascinating. It kind of goes into this whole debate about could you have a different model um, than model where basically we rely only on the platform to do most of the moderation. Could you have a um, <clears throat> distributed model where um, uh, something, something is happening on the platform that is closer to you and, and, and then you are maybe just sort of outsourcing parts of the moderation to uh, to others? Um, so it's um, this is what it's about, right? It's a protocol versus, versus platform debate. 
So that could be very interesting, and the MA can maybe induce that part of the night. Absolutely, that's really, really inspiring and thought provoking. Um, probably, you know, we will have actually explanatory workshop that the commission, the, the, the DMA task force on the 27th of February, they will run in a explanatory workshop specifically on, on interoperability. It would be interesting to see whether this issue would be raised at all. There, there is a kind of a caveat to this kind of uh, observation slash question mark or even statement is that um, the primary objective of, of the DMA concerns either horizontal or vertical competition. It, 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 it less concerns the users and users' interests and the, the ability to somehow to avoid or to optimize their experience with uh, one click avoiding all unnecessary or annoying or, or, or disturbing or harmful uh, issues, uh, designing the, the, your ecosystem in the most intuitive way. And also with with, with a recommender system, I think it's also kind of a, a, an attempt not to, to draw some line between self-preference self on one hand, and on the other hand, complete disclosure of, of the algorithms which which you use to, you know, to to avoid situation where people would just be guessing what, how to, you know, to do to, to optimize your uh, search results. What what I really enjoyed from our conversation that it leaves many unanswered questions and thus the opportunity for me to invite you at some point to continue this conversation, maybe to assess how correctly our uh, uh, reflections and predictions were. We usually have a tradition imagining uh, talking to a student who is even more perplexed than we are with this cacophony of different proposals, et cetera. But obviously our intuition probably would suggest some interesting kind of recommendations. Maybe some issues are underexplored or maybe you can see some, some elements which really merit their specific attention, academic or maybe their future as a future enforcer. If you can, if you can close our conversation with such suggestions for for students, where would you direct them? Let us maybe start with Ilaria. Difficult to um, select just one for now, but um, I think one area that deserves attention uh, and where I will be doing more research um, in the future is probably the interface um, between. Um, uh, access to platform data, uh, access to, to data for researchers and uh, trade secret protection. Um, I think um, uh, this is going to be uh, um, one of the major uh, terrain of contestations uh, when um, between the, the, the platforms and uh, uh, researchers applying for um, access and the digital services coordinator of establishment when this uh, provision um, uh, becomes um, uh, applicable and in general uh, what uh, where to draw the line uh, for um, um, uh, trade secrets uh, protection in light of uh, um, uh, public interest and possible public interest exceptions under the uh, trade secrets uh, regime. So that's a really interesting question. Um, I hadn't really thought about trade secrets uh, um, uh, so far in relation to the DSA, but now Alaria has given me something else to think about. So uh, thanks very much. Um, uh, I think that there's merit in the point that we just discussed, the sort of interplay between the DSA and the DMA. Uh, I think we're very quick to talk about them as being two separate, two separate provisions that one regulates power and the other regulates platforms. And uh, I think there's a lots of areas where they're, they're actually leaning on each other we haven't recognized yet. Um, uh, I had a quick look back at some of the phrasing in the DMA while uh, we were talking there uh, about interoperability. And I do think that there is a, a place for users to make decisions about the type of content they see using the requirements that are placed on providers in the DMA, um, uh, which would be an interesting change in the way we think about platform um, uh, regulation per se. 
Um, the other thing uh, I think is really important is understanding the role of uh, risk and basically the kind of, I think it was Martin in his opening chapeau sort of mentioned something here about um, the, the, the role of human rights um, and the role of the kind of the platform and the information ecosystem, thinking about what uh, impacts platforms have and the way that the DSA sets out um, being transparent about the potential for harm. And then the next question being, then what? Then what do we do? What, just because we've recognized the harm doesn't mean we necessarily shut it down. Maybe transparency becomes a mechanism in which you fix the harm. Other types, it's about, okay, we need to remove content. Other times we have particular users. Do we treat people as being all, always vulnerable when we recognize a particular systemic risk? And then we change the way we interact with the users based upon what that systemic risk is. Or do we kind of have everybody have everybody calm down and well, some people are sophisticated and we need to have a different types of protections for different people. Um, I also think it's going to be interesting to see how we comply or how corporate governance mechanisms inside an organization will affect the transparency and reporting obligations of the DSA. And um, I do think that that's an area of further exploration uh, and how um, you know, being transparent about how much, say, for example, child sexual abuse material is on your platform. And I don't think anybody would ever release that without sort of also telling people what they did to mitigate the harms or to move that content. Uh, so I think there's going to be a really interesting play about the, the, the relationship between internal corporate governance um, and the reporting mechanisms of the DSA or the reporting obligations of the DSA. I think that's going to be a really interesting area of further exploration. Thank you very much, Mark. Martin? Yeah, there are many, many different areas. I think uh, I also like the interface between the DMA and DSA as one of the emerging issues. I think that there's a, there's a lot there's a lot there. Um, uh, generally, interfaces of DSA with anything are, are a big issue. DSA and other EU law, oh my God, where to start? DSA and national law, oh my God, uh, even bigger problem. And, uh, and then, um, and I agree, the risk mitigation is a, is a big one. Um, <clears throat> particularly the thing that interests me the most is, is, um, is how the process will be structured what's the involvement of civil society and researchers and how, what weight do we give uh, to their opinion? Because uh, where I stand, I think the risk mitigation can be still uh, a tool that can be easily misused. Um, if uh, you look at the, the quality of our public debate um, about online platforms, uh, there's this tendency to to uh, quickly accept things as given, um, whether that's uh, the importance uh, and the harm that is caused by particular practices. And you can just look at the news cycle in the last uh, four years and you find many. And if you look at the actual research, several years later, unfortunately, obviously, because the research takes time, find out many of these things were overblown. And uh, my worry is a little bit that if this is not properly kept in check, um, from the academic standpoint, we might be just overreacting uh, uh, to whatever is now the current outrage, um, which is why I think that the importance of science and scientific um, information in this debate is, is crucial. Without science, I think risk mitigation is can be tricky. Um, uh, with scientists in, I'm more comfortable with it. Um, so that is, for me, Structure-wise, an important element is that this risk mitigation, I understand why we have opted for this solution. I understand why we couldn't have gone for anything different. I think this is probably the best we could have gotten from the other regulatory designs. Nevertheless, I still cannot shake off um, uh, the feeling that this, as any other measure, can be, um, uh, can be misused. Uh, and, and then we need to be really clear about how institutionally we we prevent that. 
And now I don't mean that you have bad intentions. I, I just mean that you are sometimes acting on information that is incomplete uh, or inaccurate, but you just don't want to or don't have uh, sufficient information. So that is, that is kind of my a um, little bit of bigger uh, question mark about this whole thing. Uh, being a supporter of the tool, I still see uh, this as a, as, a, as a limit. And I I think all the researchers should be looking into this and, and should be... Uh, but basically, what I hope is that people now start jumping on these problems related to platforms uh, almost disproportionately and start researching this to the extent that there's so much evidence that the regulators cannot move without properly reviewing evidence. Because... As you can see, sometimes when researchers review evidence, surprising things can come out, right? Just look at some reviews about the research in the area of disinformation that recently came out. You will be shocked to find out certain things. Uh, same thing about the foreign interference, what the current research shows us. Very, very different things that what uh, what we've been thinking. So I, I'm just saying it because uh, we're all just human. And, uh, um, and we cannot evaluate these things uh, without methodology. So... Um, yeah, that's kind of my food food notes for to this uh, to this whole element, and I I need to see what what we can do with it. Can I can I just follow on from that? I have an article, it's a little bit of self promotion here, but uh, I have an article that is due to be uh, published today in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. In oh, nice. And it is um, uh, part of a research project that I did with the. Max Planck Institute for Human Development. Mm. And what we did was we measured users and how they would do content moderation if they were working at a platform. Uh, we we um, took survey of, I think it was 2,500 respondents um, mm. uh, and gave them a bunch of scenarios in which they, and how they would take, would respond to certain content under a certain type of influencer, whether it was a political influencer or just a regular user. Uh, and uh, contrary to what Elon Musk will have you believe, Republicans don't like disinformation either. And Republicans <laughs> actually remove certain content. Yeah. So um, the sci I, I completely agree with Martin that we need to embrace science and we need to have that uh, behavioral insights and social sciences as part and parcel of decisions that are made uh, in the implementation of the DSA. Uh, and there is a lot of good work being done out there. And hopefully this will be the first step in getting evidence-informed implementation uh, as part and parcel, as a norm, as the standard of um, meaningful and effective platform regulation. Excellent. Um, I think it, I, I, I... I was thinking who to invite to this to, to, to have this conversation. And I'm very, very glad that I made the right choice inviting you, Ilaria Buri, you Mark Vizier, and you Martin Husseth for, for, for this for this uh, uh, for this dialogue panel. It was a great pleasure to, to 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 learn it from you and to exchange some thoughts with you. Thank you very much for your time and for sharing your brilliant ideas with all of us. Thank you, Alice. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Great seeing you guys, uh, Ilaria and Mark, and yeah, hopefully yeah. see you in person at some point as well, all of you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for having us and for the nice conversation.